A few months ago, we released a film with some of the world's leading physicists and philosophers replying to the fine-tuning argument for God. This is the argument that if the constants of nature were very, very slightly different, life would not exist. And so uh, a deity has to come in to sort of twiddle the dials, as it were, get them just right. So obviously, if we're going to um, reply to this argument, it's no surprise that we've got some pushback. And indeed, we did. Um, Luke Barnes, the astrophysicist, and Philip Goff, the philosopher, uh, offered a reply on a Capturing Christianity YouTube channel. And um, we're going to sort of offer our thoughts on some of those critiques, but also delve a bit deeper into some of these absolutely fascinating issues. So I'm so excited. We've got an absolutely amazing panel. Uh, let me introduce them. Um, so let's start with uh, Graham Priest. Graham is the uh, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the uh, Graduate Center for, at the City University of New York. He specializes in philosophy of logic, particularly non-classical logic. He also publishes in philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of science, Buddhist philosophy. And what some people might not know is he's also a fourth dan black belt in karate. So welcome, Graham. Hi. And we also have Barry Lower. Barry is the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Rutgers University. He's also the director of the Rutgers Center for Philosophy and the Sciences. And he specializes in philosophy of, of physics, particularly uh, foundations of quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, the nature of probability, and uh, physical law. So um, welcome, Barry. Thanks. And we have Dan Linford. Dan is one of the rising stars of the field of sort of the intersection between philosophy of physics and philosophy of religion. He did his PhD under Paul Draper, but also on his thesis committee was the well-known atheist cosmology, Sean, cosmologist Sean Carroll, and also the theistic fine-tuning defender Rob Collins. He's now doing a postdoc at the University of Nebraska and recently authored the book uh, Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs with Joe Schmidt, who many of you may know from the um, Majesty of Reason and Rationality Rules channel. And last but definitely not least, we have my very good friend, Niai Afshordi, who is an astrophysicist and cosmologist. He's a professor uh, at University of Waterloo in Ontario and also faculty at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, as a teenager, uh, Niai won the silver medal at the World Physics Olympiad. And uh, more recently, he's won the, is it pronounced Bouchata Prize? Um, for oh, best okay. paper, in, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, Paul Carter. Uh, for the best cosmology paper of the year, Niyash works in um, lots of exciting areas like early universe physics, quantum gravity, and black holes uh, and dark energy. So, welcome, Dan. Welcome, Niyash. Thank you. Oh. Okay, so what I thought we'd do, uh, just to start off, is um, uh, just sort of go around the room and um, give us very briefly your your thoughts on the, on the fine tuning argument, because what I think is interesting is that the critics of the argument don't all agree. They may criticize it for different reasons. Some think it's a, a pseudo problem. Some think it's a real problem, but, you know, can be solved by maybe a multiverse or some other means. Um, so, uh, Dan, why don't we start with you? What, what are your thoughts on, on the fine tuning? Yeah, argument? I, you sometimes hear people uh, say that they don't think fine tuning exists. Uh, I think that fine tuning exists in one sense, but it's not the sense that's most familiar to people outside of, of physics. So in my view, there are actually two different, at least two different senses of the phrase fine tuning. Both senses are used by both uh, philosophers and physicists, but I associate one of those senses more prominently, um, sorry, one of those senses seems to me to be more prominent among philosophers. Another sense seems to be more prominent among physicists. For that reason, I call it the first sense, the philosopher's sense, and the other sense, the physicist sense. So what is the philosopher's sense? Well, according to this sense, uh, the universe is the entity that is fine-tuned, and the claim goes that the universe is fine-tuned specifically for, for life. I think we have reason to doubt that the universe is fine-tuned in the philosopher's sense, or at least I'm skeptical as to whether we currently know that the universe is fine-tuned in the philosopher's sense. But second, there's what I call the physicist sense. And according to this sense, it's scientific theories that are the entities that are fine-tuned. So we can imagine that uh, given some theory, there is maybe some probability distribution over the possible values of the, pre of the free parameters that appear in that theory. We say that a theory is fine-tuned if the value, uh, if the measured values of the free parameters are probable, or sorry, improbable or unnatural. In other words, a fine-tuned theory is one that poorly predicts the data. 
And in this sense, there really are fine tuners, namely the physicists who constructed the theory in question and tuned the free parameters appearing within the theory. So when a theory is fine tuned in the physicist sense, the theory is defective precisely because the theory poorly predicts some of our data. What we want is a theory that does better at predicting the data. And so we look for a theory that isn't fine tuned. Uh, now there's a relationship between the two senses. If we accept right. a fine tuned theory as correctly describing our world and the data that the theory poorly predicts is the existence of life, then our theory is fine tuned. And here is the, the last point. Um, notice uh, that we have no way to say that the universe is fine tuned independent of endorsing a fine tuned theory. But given the view that fine tuning is a defect of a theory, why should we accept a fine tuned theory? For example, the measured value of the cosmological constant differs from the theoretical calculated value by something like 120 orders of magnitude. Does that mean that the universe is fine tuned? No, it means that, the, that we have the wrong theory of the cosmological constant. Ironically, it turns out that many theists have much more faith in our current scientific theories than I do. I think that <laughs> it's much more likely that our current theories are bad or at least incomplete than that our universe is fine tuned. And ironically, I think some of the some of those commentators have more faith more faith in those theories than they do in evolution, which is extremely well verified. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, let's let's see. Um, what about you, Graham? What's your thoughts on fine tuning um, these claims? So okay. I, uh, look, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Dan said. I suspect I'm going to agree with a number of my other colleagues as well. But um, let let me summarise how I see it. Um, the argument is something like to the effect that um, the best explanation for the fine tuning that you perceive is the existence of a designer. Okay, and you can articulate that argument in many ways, but a necessary condition for this argument working is that um, the probability of fine tuning uh, on uh, the, the existence of God um, on the ground of fine tuning is better than any other theory and better means more probable. If there's some other theory that's more probable, why would, why, else, why would you not believe that? Okay. So somewhere or later, somewhere or other, you've got to start talking about probability. Okay, um, so let's talk about probability. Let's grant that um, the probability of fine tuning given an intelligent designer is pretty good. I actually think that's rather dubious, but I think that's where the real problems lie. So let's grant that. So what did I just say? The probability of fine tuning given a divine designer is pretty good. That's not the relevant probability. The relevant probability is the inverse probability. The probability of God given fine-tuning, okay. After all, this is supposed to be an argument for the existence of God. All right, so um, that means that you've got to compute inverse probabilities. Yeah? You know the, the probability of fine-tuning given God or a designer, you want to know about the probability of God given fine-tuning. All right, so that how you compute these inverse probabilities is standard in probability theory. Um, and you do a little bit of mathematics, and what you see is to compute inverse probabilities, you have to divide by the probability of the evidence. So you have to um, compute the probability of the fine tuning. And the argument usually goes, well, look, it's in a very small part of an infinite range, uh, and um, that's pretty low. The trouble is that it's zero. Um, at least if you try to do any uniform distribution, it's zero because um, any any finite stretch of a continuum uh, is has measure zero compared with the whole lot. And Greg, can so, I just interrupt one sec? Is it is that because you have an infinite range of values that these could take? Is that the reason? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Carry on. All right. Yeah. So the probability of a number being between zero and one, given it could be any real number, from plus to minus infinity is, is, is zero, okay? Um, so you've got to divide by, I mean, if you, if you approach your probabilities that way, you've got to divide by zero, and that's a nonsense. You can't divide by zero. Um, and you might try and reformulate the, theory, the, the argument in different ways, 
to do with comparative probabilities or raising probabilities or whatever, but you hit this problem sooner or later, you have to compute inverse probabilities. Um, and the, the most obvious way of doing it ends up with a, a zero div, um, divisor. So it's just mathematically nonsense. The only way you can avoid this is by having a non-uniform probability distribution. Um, and there are so many different ways of trying to do this. Um, you could be a complete subjectivist, yeah, give it whatever value you like, but that's not going to give the argument any objective validity. Um, or you can try um, a probability distribution which gives whatever the actual values are, a very high probability or, or at least a non-zero probability, but it's arbitrary because you can cut the, cut the cake in so many different ways. So out with some kind of objective means of determining the prior probability, the, the probability of fine tuning, um, which um, makes it non-zero and uh, doesn't, you know, uh, isn't completely arbitrary. The argument just collapses as far as I can see. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, Niyash, why don't we come to you? Sounds good. So I'm, uh, I'm going to give you a brief, uh, I guess, physicist view or astrophysicist view of what I think of the fine tuning argument. <clears throat> so uh, I think they basically, from a physicist point of view, there are uh, two main deficiencies with arguing ab about fine tuning. I'm not going to talk about how you extend it to the presence of a go uh, God, actually. I'm, I'm going to stay away from that. So there is an experimental problem and there's a theoretical problem. So the experimental problem is we are talking about probabilities and uh, any notion of probability being, being frequentist or Bayesian requires a uh, repetition and we have one universe. So we have no experimental way of verifying any probabilistic description of a universe as a whole or constants of nature because we just have one realization of them. So I think that's a purely experimental problem. Uh, and uh, we have a theoretical problem as well because we have very good evidence, theoretical evidence, I should say, that we have uh, what we understand of the universe is a tiny fraction of what could be. Uh, for example, uh, if you think about a star which collapses into a black hole, like the one that's behind me, or I guess this must be bigger than a single star, maybe a million of stars. Um, the, the entropy of this black hole are many, many orders of magnitude bigger than the entropy of a star's that we, we know that form this black hole. And that means that the space of probabilities uh, from our best theoretical arguments is uh, orders of magnitude bigger than the space of things that we know. So that means that based on what we know of nature, uh, we we can not faithfully reconstruct the probability because uh, theoretically we don't understand most of what must exist in the space of theories. So, um, so, so based on these two uh, basic deficiencies, it's very, very little we can say concrete about fine tuning of nature. Right. Okay. Thanks, Niyash. And Barry, shall we come to you? Yeah. Well, unsurprisingly, I agree with much of what's was said before. If I were on the other side of the debate, I might say to Graham that I, I could see the proponents of the finding tune argument coming up with ways of responding to his technical objections by introducing conditional probability as something from the, as, as a basic notion as Polite Popper did. But I don't think this is really gonna get them off the hook in the end of the, the day. I think what, one of the things that Graham pointed out was, well, if these were subjective probabilities, they could be anything you want, but that's not gonna give the argument any validity. So you gotta give these likelihoods, how likely it is that the universe has life given theism and how likely the universe has life, given whatever the alternative is, let's call it naturalism, because that's what these people usually do. And you, these likelihoods have to be objective. If they were objective, I think the fine tuning argument would go a certain distance, even though you couldn't compute posterior probabilities until you had prior probabilities, um, you would still maybe argue that the evidence we have supports the theism over naturalism. I could see them saying that. The real trouble is that it's not any way possible and no way to understand 
and Graham alluded to this, these probabilities as objective probabilities. There are a number of reasons for this. Uh, uh, one, I think Nyash was speaking, he was saying is look, objective probabilities come from scientific theories which specify what the objective probabilities are. Like in quantum mechanics, they specify objective probabilities, at least I think it does. Statistical mechanics does, okay? So they're really something about the world that make these the right probabilities. But of course, the fine tuning argument can't use anything like that. So it can't understand this in the way we understand objective probabilities within the sciences. They can't be subjective probabilities. So that leaves one possibility. They're somehow logical, it's called logical or rational probabilities. And people have tried this idea. Uh, the most sophisticated development I know, although I'm sure they're more sophisticated, it's a popular idea in parts of philosophy without being clearly developed. But the physicist E.T. James, you know, really loved this idea. And I'm afraid I could say for myself that I succumbed to it for a few years and was trying to figure out how to make sense of it. But in the end of the day, for reasons close to the ones that Graham mentioned, it's going to it ends you it ends up you up in contradictions. But ultimately, it's based on the principle of indifference, and the principle of indifference says, look, if you don't know whether two hypotheses are true, you have no reason to prefer one to the other. Assign them equal probability. But I think the right thing to do is to just say, I don't have a clue. And that right. probabilities just don't even apply in such a situation. Uh, um, there are I think other... is, it, is it right, David Albert was on a, at the conference you hosted at Rutgers, and I remember him saying, "What's wrong with I don't have a clue?" Yeah, yeah. Well, um, and you may know this. David and I are close friends. We teach together. We write together. And I don't know who started saying this first, but anyway, it's the right thing to say. I, I think. But this is a long argument within philosophy, um, right. because there are arguments why, you know. You, you better have a clue or else you're going to be screwed by the world or something like that. But this is not what we want to get into here. The other problem is with this is, look, these conditional probabilities are just completely ill-formed. You know, theism is not a scientific hypothesis. So how are you going to, and where, where are the probabilities going to come from? And on top of that, we have a lot of evidence besides for there being life, uh, which makes theism, I think, incredibly implausible. I mean, if I were God, uh, this is me speaking, but if I were God, I would not have, I'm not sure what to fill this in, but let's say Donald Trump. Okay, I would have not allowed that to come into existence. But you can put in your favorite thing that you don't think should be there in a good world. There are many other things too. And of course, as, as cosmologists will point out, the gap, the there are what a, a billion or a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. There are 100 billion galaxies in the observable of the universe. I mean, why did God have to do that much to, to create life? Okay. And the entropy of the universe was very, very small. And why? Of the early universe. Die? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of evidence that, that tell against the theism hypothesis. The last thing I want to say, if it's okay for me to take another two yep. minutes, is there's another way of doing the argument, which you often hear, which doesn't really make prob put probability in the front, although it's there in the back, and that's just using explanation. That's somebody sort of stamping their foot and saying, there got to be a better explanation. I think Dan had this in mind, I, or did actually said this. And he's like, you just can't have these funny laws. Now, actually, if you look at the laws in our universe, they look rather cool, okay, and fairly simple. You do want to some account, why does the universe have simple laws? I think the place to look to at is not God, but human beings, which also Dan alluded to, and what we invent laws for. But in any case, we think of all the possible ways universes could be, not just the values of these parameters, but also the, all the possible laws you could cook up. Why do our universe have laws which allow for there to be uh, life, or my favorite is pistachio ice cream. Why does the universe allow for there to be pistachio ice cream? It does, that's great, because there's an explanation of why the, there is a pistachio ice cream I bought. So there's this sort of ex explanatory deficit that it looks like is there. But I think often one has to take a step back if you think a view has an explanatory deficit and just ask, what alternative is it? 
is there. And it usually the alternatives often introduce their own explanatory deficits. Theism certainly does that. I don't have a clue what, what God really is or how he's supposed to do his work and so on. So from my point of view, I wouldn't spend two seconds on the fine tuning argument. The, it, I think it's just such crap from, a, from the beginning. But I do think it raises interesting issues about probability, which I think an explanation, which I think are very, very interesting. And, um, and that's why I'm interested in it. All right. Well, thank you, Barry. That's, that's an awesome talk. All um, right. So now what I think we should do is, is go to some of the criticisms that were made of the film that we will put together. Um, so um, now I have put them at about one and a half times speed. And of course, it was a two hour video response. So we're not going to be able to respond to everything they say, but we're trying to hit the main 10 points. The worry I have is that um, it gives the impression that fine tuning has um, religious apologists on one side and all the philosophers and physicists and people who know what they're talking about on the other side. I could go out and make a documentary like this if I had the time. I could go and interview Martin Rees, Paul Davis, Bernard Carr, George Ellis, Aaron Wall, Geraint Lewis, Stephen Barr, Don Page, Max Tegmark, Avi Loeb, Mario Livio. Um, it's fine to be one-sided, right? That's okay. You just have to tell us. You have to put that on the label. I think it's intellectually dishonest to present a sort of debunking style presentation about a matter for which the relevant experts are not in agreement. I should probably take this one because it's directed at me, at me as the producer of the film. Um, so first off, I should say that Philip Goff has apologised for the comment that it was dishonest. So thank you. Um, going to the other point. So the first one was about the apologists versus uh, the people that know what they're talking about, which is slightly unfair on those apologists, but never mind. Um, but the point, the film was about criticising the argument for God from fine tuning. So it's not surprising then that the people that make that argument are religious apologists and they do it much more effectively than anybody else. So for example, Luke Barnes made a film about fine tuning. It had 15,000 views. Justin Briley, an apologist who's a good friend of mine as well, he's a nice guy. Um, he made a film that had 3 million views. So that was the one that we re replied to because that's what's in the public domain. And that seems appropriate to me. Um, secondly, it's sort of, um, it feels like an unfair double standard because the proponents of the argument, they get to make the best case they can for the argument. And fair enough, they should do that. So why shouldn't the uh, critics do the same, which is what we did. Um, furthermore, Luke's claim that he could make a similar film and he listed all these scientists. Those scientists agree um, that there's fine tuning, but they don't. Most of them, I think, do not think that fine tuning is evidence of God. And that's often hidden. You know, you'll often see presentations of fine tuning argument and they say, look at all these physicists that agree. But if you ask them, do they agree that it's evidence for God? They, they don't. And that's that's sort of often hidden. Um, uh, you know, case in point, um, you know, Philip Goff did an article in uh, Scientific American and Eon magazine and um, he quoted Lee Smolin as saying the odds, you know, of a life emitting universe are, you know, ridiculously unlikely but didn't mention, you know, that he has a, a solution to the a naturalistic solution using Darwinian mechanisms. Um, so, so that seems, you know, slightly problematic. Um, now, as for the title, um, you know, he said, it's okay to be one sided as long as you put it on, on put it on the tin as it were. Um, well, the title of the film was physicists and philosophers reply to the fine tuning argument. Um, now we did later change it to critique the fine tuning argument to be a bit clearer, but I thought that was pretty clear. We had it in the introduction that it was going to be a criticism. We had it in the description below that it was going to be different points of view, but all critical of the fine tuning argument. And again, to sort of point out the double standard, um, you know, there was um, a video that Philip Goff and Luke Barnes were in. Um, it didn't have anyone from this point of view that the fine tuning is um, not a real problem. And in fact, there was a survey of ph philosophers. I don't know if you saw the Phil Paper survey and they asked philosophers, what do you think of the fine tuning problem? And you had uh, about 17% think it was down to God. And uh, interestingly, about 19% of philosophers believe in God. <laughs> um, the other, the, the biggest groups were uh, that there is, uh, that it's a brute fact and that it was, there is no fine tuning problem. They, they, if you put those two together, which are, I think you can lump together as sort of no explanation needed, um, they were the biggest group. They, they, so they did this video basically talking about fine tuning. They didn't have anyone from that perspective. And what was the title of the film? It was Fine Tuning Discussion featuring Philip Goff and Luke Barnes and Geraint Lewis. And, and one last example, then I'll finish up. Um, 
Luke Barnes was on a, another video on capturing Christianity, and they had four, I think it was four Christian physicists, uh, critiquing Sean Carroll uh, for his points he made in his debate with William Lane Craig. It was a very one-sided conversation. That's fair enough. They can do that. Uh, but what was the title? It was called A Review of the, um, what was it? A Review of Craig versus Carroll. Nothing in the title would tell you that it was a one-sided conversation. So I just feel this is a, uh, a double standard. You know, I was sort of dismayed to see the the kind of negative reaction that uh, that the documentary that you put together received. Um, I really like uh, Luke Barnes's his work. I disagree with him about about theism, but the book that he co-authored with uh, with Grant is a is a good book. That one of the best books on fine tuning that's that's out there, and it's an accessible book. Um, I encourage people to read it, and uh, and then Philip Goff's book. Uh, or books are um, also really interesting. I find consciousness really difficult to understand. Um, I don't know that I agree with with Goff's panpsychism, but I do find Bertrand Russell's views about consciousness attractive, and those are close cousins of of the sort of view that Goff is is defending in in his work. Um, so yes, I I found it disappointing and disheartening that um, I mean, look so. In philosophy, all the time, what people do when they write a paper is they write a paper arguing for a particular point of view. That's what every philosophy paper pretty much ever does. And then other people respond to it. And, and I don't see why YouTube can't be treated the same way, that we can't have conversations where you have one video that presents one sort of perspective and another video that presents another sort of perspective. I don't know why your documentary had to... Um, give equal time to both views or something. I agree. Okay, so should we we'll they, play them? Oh, go ahead. Are they, are they imagine this as, as the sort of thing to be on Fox News or MSNBC or something mm -hmm. like that? You know, and of course, as Stan was saying, that's not what we're, we're, what this, this is about. I, I also just to chime in, I, I, I also agree that Barnes and Lewis's book is really good, but I'm a little bit puzzled. I thought Lewis didn't really accept the argument for God. Isn't that true? That's correct. Yeah, he argues for a, for a multiverse. So, but this is the, the issue that I have. You often get this impression that you have to choose between God or a multiverse. Right. But again, if you look at that field paper survey, um, you'll see that the majority of philosophers pick neither. I mean, I think that there's a so there's a really important point here that just almost gets almost always gets glossed over in the philosophical literature, and then even if the situation is worse on YouTube. When often when physicists use the term the phrase fine tuning, they're talking about a feature of a theory. They'd be able to say, well, like, you know, such and such a theory is fine tuned. That's supposed to be a defect of a theory. We want a theory that replaces it that doesn't have that problem. Um, and you'll hear people talking about naturalness, uh, you know, whether the parameters in a the theory are natural. But none of this really has anything to do with the existence of life or of God or something like that. So to pick out a bunch of um, physicists and point out that Oh, they talk about fine tuning. Uh, I mean, I, that seems a bit odd to me because we're not told what sense they talk about fine tuning. Right? I mean, I agree that there are theories that have the defect that they are fine tuned theories. I disagree with the with the perspective that we can know that our universe is somehow fine tuned. Whatever that's supposed to mean. Right. And that, that will come up in a minute, actually. All right. So let's let's go to the next clip. So just a bit of context. This is going to be Carlo Ravelli arguing um, against fine tuning. And then we'll hear a um, little bit of him and then Luke Barnes replying. Nobody would be able today from the standard model to predict chemistry and life. Nobody at all. So how do you know what would happen if you change the value of, the cosmo of a constant? Imagine you change the mass of a quark, uh, you know, a coupling of the Higgs a little bit. Of course, there would not be carbon, there would not be stars, but there would be something else. And nobody is able to say correctly and, and, and plausibly and credibly that the universe would not be complex and whatever, because we're not able to do this calculation. There is a, a broad scientific literature in the professional you know, physics journals, which claims to do exactly what Ravelli says is impossible, which claims to predict exactly what would happen if these constants had been different. There's all sorts of papers out there doing the hard work of doing the calculations of what would happen if you change these constants. And 
Uh, he's giving the impression here that, oh, no one really knows because no one's bothered to do the calculation. Yes, we can't start from, if you just gave me the standard model of particle physics, or gave all any physicist, and they gave them the standard model of particle physics and the values of all the constants that go in that equation, they would not be able to say, oh, yeah, uh, definitely if that um, equation holds, there will be life in that universe. Uh, they wouldn't be able to rule it out, but they wouldn't be able to definitely prove that because the math is just a bit too difficult. But that's not what fine tuning is trying to do, and it's not what fine tuning needs. The arguments that um, are there in the literature, which you think someone who is familiar with the literature might actually try and deal with rather than just slagging them off as being impossible and arrogant, are things like, you know, if the constants were um, such and such, then uh, the most stable uh, lightest particle you could make out of just quarks, in our universe it's the proton, which you may be familiar with, in these other universes it would be a different kind of particle, for various reasons having to do with energy levels, that particle wouldn't be able to bind to itself or to anything else. And so the smallest piece of stuff in the universe, the only stable thing in the universe, is unable to create any structure at all. Uh, Niyash, so you've defended this view very similar to Carlo's. So do you have any thoughts on Luke's reply to that? I do, um, if I can chime in. Oh. Go ahead, Byron. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, Luke just hasn't paid any attention to the literature on counterfactuals. It's clear. Because when you think of some, how things were, which is something that's false, let's say that the gravitational constant is some different value from the one it does, and you think what would happen then, you have to consider what else would have to be the case, what changes would make in the, in the laws and so on. So I actually don't believe that there are any really clear counterfactuals. In fact, how to deal with counter-nomics, which is what they would call, is just a complete mess within the philosophical literature. I just said I know a lot about something I write about a lot. So I don't think he really paid attention to, to this literature. So I don't think this remark is right. Uh, the other thing I would say is Carlo talks fast, but not as fast as in that film. Does he? <laughs> well, we did speed him up a little bit. Otherwise, we, this conversation is going to be way too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so just to follow up, so, so there, I, I actually, I wanted to make a comment about uh, about I mean the, the previous point that I mean I think a lot of people that were named that they were I mean either good I know them well or the good friends of mine we had dinner lunch together and such and they had musings and fine tuning is kind of complaints that people do every now and then but uh, I mean. Uh, Certainly, argument for God is not not that any of them have ever made or I've ever heard, uh, and even the fine tuning. Uh, I mean, it, or, or they, so many of them are against multiverse and and fine tuning. They don't necessarily. I mean, one day may be for it, another day against it. So, uh, so, so I think that's my personal experience with uh, how the distinguished physicists think about it. <clears throat> now, as to. Uh, uh, what happens in a different universe, whether there will be life or not. Of course, you can do calculations. You could make assumptions and then do calculations and could be, uh, could be as sophisticated as you want to be. But the question is, do you trust it? I mean, is there any confidence in the result of that calculation? Not that you don't know how to do the math, but the question is, have you included all the effects? I, do you have the right, I mean, powerful enough machinery? And uh, you could ask a simple question. There is a way to test it. We don't live in those alternate universes. We live in this universe, but you could ask, okay, so how many galaxies or how many stars will have life around them? Can anybody faithfully calculate that? Because that's something that can be tested because something we, this is in this universe and no one has been able to do it. I mean, there is, there is no credible calculation that could predict probability of life given the constants that we have given the universe that we have. Uh, are we alone in our galaxy or does every other star have uh, live beings around them? So uh, for the thing that we know is testable, if no one can actually make a credible prediction, why would we trust anyone for predictions in alter the alternate universes, which there, we have no way of testing? So that's kind of the main objection which I think uh, Carlo is, is is pointing to that. Yes, you can do a calculation, but do you trust it? And I don't think anyone, uh, honest physicist would really trust it. Right. So I did, I you actually... Oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so I, I mean, I, I imagine that the way that they would, they would try to push back on that is they would say, look, uh, maybe you can't say which universes would actually have life in them, but perhaps what you could say is that a universe couldn't have life. I mean, there's, there's, there's this famous calculation that Weinberg did um, supposedly showing that if the cosmological constant is too large, then you can't, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you're not going to get life. Uh, and why? Because you don't have any kind of large scale structure formation at all. So, you know, I don't, I don't know how you would push back on that, but I think one thing to bear in mind in these arguments is that uh, 
none of these folks are going to be able to quantify for us what a small or what, what a large or small perturbation of the cosmological constant would actually be. We have no measure on the space of possible values of the cosmological constant. Mm -hmm. So they tell us that you know if you if you change the cosmological the cosmological constant by a small amount, then you don't get life. Well, small relative to what? I mean, small always has to be relative to a measure. They don't have one. No one has one. So I, I don't know what to make of that result. It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like right. someone can actually support the statement that it is small. Right. Yeah, I did actually get um, a reply from uh, Carlo. So I'll just read a bit of it. Um, and he said, uh, Luke Barnes has completely missed the point I made. He refers to scientific literature that shows that things that exist in our universe could not exist if the constant of nature were different. It is true that that literature exists. I've never put this in doubt. This literature is correct. My point was completely different, has nothing to do with the literature. My point was that if the constants were different, of course, what is around us now would not exist. But something else would exist, completely different. And it is this completely different universe that we are not able to predict. And that's a close quote. Um, but I think there's some relevance here because he, Luke said something like, well, if you gave the constants of nature and the standard model to a physicist, they wouldn't be able to either predict life or rule it out. But I tell me if you think I've got this wrong. I think they would rule it out because they would not have enough matter antimatter asymmetry in their models. They wouldn't have any dark matter because that's not in the standard model either. So they would, I think, presumably say this universe um, is sterile, has no life in it. And they, they would obviously be wrong. Um, so if they're wrong for this universe, why should we believe them for the other one? And the reason is, you know, there's some other thing that obviously is giving us that matter antimatter asymmetry. We don't even know what that is, but there's some other effect that arises that sort of saves the day. And how do you know what other effects might happen if you start messing around with the laws of physics? You have the point of fine tuning, right? These parameters have improbable values given the theories that we have. So someone hands you a theory and asks you, what kind of universe do you get out of this? Well, <laughs> if they're right that you tend to get lifeless universes out of these theories, so, um, so that's why you need fine tuning. Then uh, what you would actually predict is a lifeless universe. So uh, I think that, that the problem with fine tuning is that uh, really it's it's very much uh, depends on your assumptions and then there is no convergence. And that is why there is a huge literature on it because basically you make some assumptions and you make a prediction and then you add one assumption to that and you get the completely opposite result. <laughs> It is a, it's a perfect prescription for having large literature, but zero progress happening uh, in right. in the field. Uh, but actually, the, 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 I, I want to uh, point to something that brings us back uh, uh, full circle. Uh, so the argument that Weinberg had for Lambda, and in fact, he Weinberg was a famous atheist and he was arguing against the existence of God. He was saying that the way to understand the cosmological constant being so small uh, is you have a multiverse and then uh, we can only live places where the cosmological constant is not very big. So most of the universe is a sterile, most of the most, most of the multiverse. And Avi Loeb, who um, who I guess the, uh, our critics were saying that was uh, arguing for fine tuning. In fact, Avi Loeb critiques Weinberg uh, at some point because he's saying that this thing that you cannot form galaxies is completely ad hoc because you look at galaxies around us and they say, okay, no, this kind of galaxies maybe with a big cosmological constant will form. But then you can look at high redshifts, early universe, and we find we keep finding galaxies at higher and higher redshifts, and those galaxies exist, uh, even though conditions were very different. Conditions maybe but much more hostile, hostile there. So this says, argument that if to change things a little bit, life doesn't exist or complexity cannot exist. Well, we look at various places that look very inhospitable, at least to complexity, and yet, and yet we find complexity there. Um, so, so this is very premature to say that, uh, I mean, if you change things, then you don't have complexity because it could be complexity of a very different form. Maybe you have gravitational atoms instead of electromagnetic atoms, and you could have life of that form or complexity of that form. So, so yeah, imagination is boundless, but it's hard to make predictions. And we have no idea what, how to characterize life anyway. Exactly. Okay, so the next objection um, is going to be more to do with probability theory, away, moving away from physics. So um, just to put it in context, we asked some of our talking heads to explain the different types of probability. Um, and they sort of say, well, there's objective probability and there's subjective probability and there's propensity. Um, and um, but however, we didn't subdivide uh, 
the Bayesian approach into subjective and objective Bayesianism. So that's going to be sort of the context of this criticism. Sorry, wait a minute, wait a minute. I played something else, actually. But they have Guth on, and they have him saying the Ravelli-type things about lots of fine-tuning, but they cut him off before he says, you know, he does think the, fi the cosmological constant is fine-tuned. That was a point that Philip Goff made about Alan Guth's position on fine-tuning, because right at the beginning of the film, he said, you know, we don't, he doesn't believe that there is this fine-tuning in the, in the first sense, Dan, that you mentioned, fine-tuning for life. However, then we did cut him off when he starts talking about the cosmological constant, because um, that is in our, another film. But here I feel it's about the theory, that it's that sense of fine-tuning. So that's why we cut him off, because that's not the sense of fine-tuning that we're disputing. Um, so, so that was that. So let me now go back to this issue of uh, objective Bayesianism. So since you recorded this, I realise we need a bit more explanation about probability to help us with the next section of the discussion. And this is important because the fine-tuning argument depends on the assertion that life-permitting constants of nature are in some sense improbable. But in what sense? Now, a frequentist approach says probabilities are long-run frequencies, i.e. how often an event occurs. In this case, the probability of life-permitting constants is just one because we've only observed one universe and the constants don't change, hence the name constants. Now everyone agrees that won't work, so fine-tuning advocates use what's called Bayesian probabilities, and these are commonly used in science. Now here you start with the best guess about probability, which is called the prior probability, and then you collect evidence and update, giving you what's called the posterior probability. And there are certain rules that have to be applied, for example, uh, probabilities have to add up to one. Now for more on this, you can see our previous film, and I'll put a, a link in the description below, and I'll link to our critics film, and I'll put a link to Joe Schmidt's uh, recent film going into much more detail about Bayes' theorem. Now he also explains the difference between subjective and objective Bayesians is that the latter will use some additional principle, for example, the principle of indifference. Now not everyone agrees this makes a difference, and that's where a lot of the debate lies. So for example, Hans Halverson, who's a professor of philosophy at physics and was in our last film, he described objective Bayesianism as an oxymoron, uh, which is why he described Bayesians as subjective. There's another conceptual probability here, namely objective Bayesianism, according to which there is a fact of the matter about which probabilities we ought to plug in. And that is almost certainly the kind of probability that you're going to run a fine-tuning argument on. I think it's the kind of probability Luke or Robin Collins or whoever is going to run on. Graham Barry, I think this is for you guys. So tell us a little bit, what is the difference between subjective and objective Bayesianism? And can this... You know, I, know Phil Goff Goff pretty, I can just explain it. I know Philip Goff pretty well. I, all I would say is don't trust what he has to say about probability. <laughs> um, but putting that aside, if that's an ad hoc, ad hominem kind of remark. So objective probability means there's something about reality that makes these the right probabilities. The next question is, what are probabilities and objective probabilities? There's various ideas around. You mentioned some. There's a propensity view, something that was cooked up by giving a name to probability without really explaining what it is. But by Popper and Geary and some people early on. Um, it, it goes along with people who think that the way to think about the, the laws in general is that laws and probabilities, chances do something. They actually act it. Maybe laws push things around. And if I can make a connection to something going on before, um, the, the idea of laws of nature actually has a theological origin. Um, and that sort of dropped away. And it's curious to me that the people now have come up with the fine tuning arguments kind of it's going to look like they want to stick the, the theological origin back in. I can say more about that if you're interested in, but uh, you know, I've written a little bit about the history of the concept of laws. Um, so probability might be objective. That's one notion. They might be propensities. There's another view, there might be frequencies, there might be hypothetical frequencies, which gets us in to the frequencies that would be the case, so we're back into counterfactuals. There's also a view which I really like, which is basically based on some ideas of David Lewis's, but I don't think he develops it quite the right way, and that's called the best systems account. It's like an actual frequency account, but much more sophisticated. That account just is totally useless to the fine tuning argument because that makes the probabilities depend on the actual distribution of events in the world. And uh, we just saw a world, okay? If, you have, if it's a multiverse, well, you might do it for the multiverse, but God doesn't play any role in this kind of a, account. And in fact, God doesn't play any role in any of these 
accounts really. So the only when people when people like Lee Smolin says, well, he thinks he agrees that it's improbable that uh, the parameters have the value they have, but he can explain why they have the values they have with his interesting Darwinian uh, account. I would ask him immediately, what do you mean by it's improbable? Other than that's how it strikes you on Monday morning. Uh, there's nothing objective about thinking that. I mean, I, so if I can interrupt for a second. Yeah, go ahead, Dan, go ahead. I think, I, I think what he, what Goff uh, means by that and what I know Luke means by that, because um, I was just looking at his book earlier today, is, um, so they say that they're objective Bayesians. They mean that they have a view something like the view that you attributed to E.T. Jaynes. So they mean that there are- Name a few others. I, I can, but- Yeah, so I mean, uh, so Paul Draper and Richard Swinburne, at least in philosophy of religion, have a view like this where they think Has that- Has it developed the counts of their objective Bayesianism? Yeah, they, so yeah, they have an account of um, intrinsic probability, which is supposed to be the probability of hypothesis, uh, conditionalized on nothing other than uh, tautological information. And um, and that's supposed to be the, the credences with which I, like, I rational that's agents that's begin. Really I'm just giving an opinion now, it's just worthless. I mean, there's nothing in logic that determines this. The only thing they ever appeal to is they come back to the principle of indifference. And as Graham pointed out, and other people pointed out, the principle of indifference that it drew up in, in contradictions. Maybe there are ways in which you can go overcome the contradictions involved. So what they, that. what those folks typically say nowadays is that, I mean, they reject the principle of indifference. That's going to be important later, because I know that there's like going to be a question about the principle of difference. They, they all agree that the principle of indifference is garbage. But what they do is they try to provide a different principle that does the job that the principle of indifference was supposed to do. So um, there is a, uh, so on, on Paul Draper's account, um, the intrinsic probability of hypothesis is going to be determined by um, the modesty and the scope of a hypothesis. Um, those two features alone. And he's also gonna make the claim that you're not able to give uh, specific numbers to um, objective to these objective probabilities. Instead, what it is is that the relationships between them are supposed to be modeled by the probability calculus. So but, modesty and scope are good in hypotheses, but why should that have to do with what why your objective degrees of belief should be? That's the question they have to answer. What does that have to do with what your objective degrees of belief? So ultimately, it's going to come back to that degrees of belief. It might even give good reasons to investigate the world by looking at right. modest and, and wide scope hypotheses first. But I don't see any reason why it's, it's these are objective degrees of belief. I mean, you know, maybe they're wrong about this, but they, <laughs> but what they what they come back to ultimately is their intuitions about the features of a hypothesis. I think um, you're going to bring up a fancy guy like Timothy Williamson, who seems to like. Uh, some sort of objective uh, epistemic probabilities. But um, I maintain that there's no good account of them and I would be you know, willing to go to the bank with it wherever you go. Graham, can we, hear, can we, I just want to get Graham in on this because yeah, yeah. this is something that he's particularly interested in. So what was your view on, you know, can objective Bayesianism save the fine tuning argument? How do you see it? I, I don't think so. I mean, I agree largely with what's been said. Um, uh, the people in question appeal, are appealing to Bayesianism, right? And there are two versions of Bayesianism. One says uh, your degree of belief can be anything you damn well like as long as it fits the probability calculus, okay? Um, and that ain't going to help because people have all different kinds of prior probabilities. Um, if it's completely subjective, you've got to come up, if the arguments have any value, you've got to give it the, these priors some objective value. And that's where the rub hits the road. I mean, it comes back to this question I was talking about of finding priors. Um, and it must be said that probability theorists have been trying that since at least the 1950s, and they haven't been very successful. That's the appeal of subjective Bayesianism because you avoid this problem. Um, you. Uh, one standard way of doing it is appeal to the principle of indifference, but that doesn't work very well for reasons we might come to. Yeah, um, actually, uh, Graham, could you just briefly explain what is why does that have a why is that a problem? Well, I the, think... the principle oh. says um, uh, if you've got two hypotheses and uh, no reason to prefer one to the other, then um, you give both probability a half. Um, and and uh, okay, if you've got more than one, you divide by the number. 
Now, um, you can, if you apply that consistently, you get all kinds of problems because um, these, uh, uh, the, the probability measures are not invariant under nonlinear transformations. So oh, that, sorry, Graham, that might be a phrase the audience might <laughs> struggle with. Yeah, okay. Can you explain that? Um, so, um, suppose you've got a train um, that leaves, say, New York at noon and goes to, arrives in Boston at um, four, say. And you might say, well, I mean, um, we don't know anything else. So it's as likely to arrive um, before two o'clock because after two o'clock, each has probability half. Um, but uh, you might also say, look, um, uh, New York to Boston is say 100 miles. Um, it's likely, this is likely to be traveling under 50 miles an hour as over 50 miles an hour. If it's traveling at 50 miles an hour, it'll get there in uh, two hours. And then you do the rest of the computation and you see you get a different answer. It's because um, when you do the computation, um, speed and different, uh, the, the, the transformation between time and uh, speed are, are not linear. So you, you essentially right. can change the scale by just changing the way you measure, okay? Um, so is it be right to say you ask the question one way, you get one answer, you ask it a different way, equally valid, you get a different answer? Correct. Right, okay. So here's where I want to bring in the next criticism then, because this is where Philip Goff is going to reply to that. Again, this is the right place to push. It, I think the fine-tuning theorist is going to have to appeal to the principle of indifference, and there's a healthy debate about this, and all these guys are making good arguments, I think. Um, however, what, what argument have we been given here against the principle of indifference? What Graham Priest was giving us there was the argument that there are cases in which the principle of indifference is inapplicable because it leads to contradictory results. Okay, grant that, but at best that shows there are some cases in which the principle of indifference is inapplicable. It doesn't follow from that, at least without further argument, that the principle of indifference is never applicable. So, I mean, there obviously are cases in which it is applicable. I mean, the, the case Al Hayek gives is, you know, you're on a game show, the prize is behind one of three doors, and you're trying to think, you know, I wonder, is it behind door B? What's the probability? One in three, right? Because the you use the principle of indifference. You don't know, you know there's a fact of the matter about which it's behind. You don't know which. You divide your probability. You divide your credence evenly. So one thing, actually, I want to come back to you, Graham, on this. Um, but it seemed to me the example he gave was uh, with uh, where you know how many possibilities there are, three doors, right? And it's finite. But for the constant nature, it seems we don't know how many values they could take. It, it's certainly true that there are some cases where it's more natural to apply the principle in one way than another. If you've got three doors, uh, then each, prob each door has a probability of a third a priori, right? Now, there might be circumstances where you worry about that, but it, it is natural to appeal to it that way. That's true. Um, the thing is, though, that you, you, if you've got a general principle that you know gives you trouble when applied generally, and you want to apply it in specific cases, it's only intellectually honest to say exactly what the principle is and why it's legitimate to apply it the way you want in this particular case. Um, we know all kinds of problems, all kinds of principles in mathematics and logic. Um, which give rise to inconsistency, and no one's ever said, "Well, okay, um, we'll we'll apply them if you know we feel like it, or it seems right to do so." It's only intellectually honest to say what exactly the principle is, and how and why you can apply it to the case in point. So um, that's the intellectually honest reply. I think that a defender of the principle of indifference would have to give in this case. So, so Neil, go ahead. Yeah, I, I I think I had a good example for the for how this principle of indifference could be very confusing. Uh, um, so imagine aliens suddenly pop up somewhere on Earth uh, randomly, right? And you want to ask, are they more likely to show up on the equator or on the poles? Okay. So now you could argue, okay, so there are two poles and there is one equator. So they're twice as likely to show up on the, <laughs> on the pole than on the equator. That's the wrong way of using a principle of indifference. Uh, the right way to say, okay, so uh, if you look at some areas, I don't know, one meter across uh, that uh, intersects with the equator, it's just the equator is very long, goes like 40,000 kilometers. So there's a large probability that you end up uh, next to the equator, poles are two points, so just two meter across. Um, 
So it's uh, your 40,000 or actually probably, yeah, or something like that. Uh, for maybe maybe 40 million is <laughs> more likely to be on the equator. So 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 this is the thing it is nonlinear transformation is that you don't, uh, it, it, it's I guess what we call measure uh, of the probability and you cannot just use a uh, principle in indifference for especially for continuous uh, uh, parameter. Par parameters can change, take any number. Uh, it could take you completely the opposite direction. So right. like, I don't understand the <laughs> like objection that that Goff made there, right? So look, I, what he's saying is, okay, so uh, Graham showed that there's a case where the principle indifference doesn't apply. And we just saw another case. And now he turns around and says, well, fine, it doesn't apply in those cases, but it doesn't. This That just means the principle's not true. <laughs> I, like, <what? laughs> right. You know, what we, what we need is a different, if, if you're, like I was saying before, there are people who try to resurrect this program, but all the people that I'm aware of that try to do that, do so by replacing the principle indifference with some other principle that they think is more plausible. Now, Barry's going to come back and say, those principles are all garbage too. Fine, maybe they are. But the point is that I don't know of anyone that thinks that like the prince, the, the like original version of the principle indifference is, is true. Like I, Right. And there's something that we pointed out in the film. I mean, Philip said, well, Philip Goff said, well, we need a further argument, but we did have a further argument, as I recall, which was what Barry and uh, Graham uh, uh, and Hans Havelson pointed out, was that there's an infinite range here. So which value do you assign to each possible value for the constants? If there's, you, they've got to add up to one. So if you assign them any finite probability, I think this is what you said, Graham, if I remember rightly, they, they, they're going to add up to infinity. So, you, OK, you can assign them zero probability when they're going to add up to zero. How do you get them to add up to one? And that was uh, well, that was the problem you, you pointed out, Graham, if I remember rightly. Yeah. So if you apply the principle of difference that all equal lengths, finite parts of the real line have the same probability, which is one way of applying the principle of difference, everyone has probability zero. Because if right. you add all up uh, and then non-zero, you get an infinite quantity. So um, that's one kind of simple-minded way of uh, applying the principle of indifference, and obviously it doesn't give you what you want. So you've got to find a better way of doing it. Uh, okay. And, uh, Sorry. But, yeah, I wanted to say there are really two different issues here, and then a sort of over for me an overarching issue about the principle of indifference. One is you, one's asking the, these people who are proponents of the fine-tuning argument for some principle to tell you where they're getting their probabilities from. They give a principle, the principle of indifference. They're shown it leads to contradictions. And they say, hmm, um, well, it doesn't always lead to contradictions. Well, they got their probabilities anyway, OK. The other and the deeper problem is, why did the, what they end up with, why are they probabilities? For them to be probabilities, they have to guide what your degrees of belief ought to be. And they've given no reason to think that, absolutely none. The overarching issue for me about this whole discussion, particularly as we've been carrying it on, is because some of the issues are so interesting in here, maybe the ones that didn't get at the cosmology, and cosmology is very interesting, there's a tendency for, for people, me among them, to take seriously their arguments individually and give back other, other arguments, and it goes on and on and on. When if you just stand back, you can just see, you know, it's it, what they're doing is just an absurd line of thought. And I think to get to the bottom of it is it philosophically more effective. I'm not sure it's rhetorically more effective, but um, that, that's what I think in the way I, I teach it. OK, so I'll just move on to the next objection. It's going to be related on the same theme. This is an important challenge, and it's right that they're pressing it. So I, I think the way there is, in my view, a fairly straightforward way to deal with infinities, and that is just in terms of what you build into the background information. Any Bayesian calculation builds stuff into the background information that you're sort of taking as assumed. So you can just build into the background information that we are in a finite set of universes. We are one of a, one, one member of a finite set of universes. Um, I mean, I don't mean committing to the multiverse. I just mean that we are in a finite set of possible universes corresponding to a finite range of the variables. And then you end up with a, a finite range of the variables, and then you apply the principle of indifference there. Now, you might say, well, isn't that just cheating? You're just building it into the background information. But the point is, any Bayesian calculation has to do this. Any Bayesian calculation puts shed loads of stuff in the background information, because otherwise you'd be dealing with any, every single possible alternative, and you'll get into these troubles with infinities. So uh, anyone like to reply to that? 
Well, I don't really understand it. I mean, it's true that when you compute probabilities, you take background assumptions into account. Um, but the background assumption that was mentioned was that there's a finite, we were in a finite universe with um, uh, one of a finite number of universes too. Um, but that, that may be true or it may not be. But the point is that space and time are infinite. Even if you think that they um, are, are finite in sort of duration, it's that they still have, they're infinitely, they're infinitely dense. So that doesn't get rid of the problem of infinitude. Also, the background assumption is that the universe, the actual universe, has parameters which allow for life. And if that's the only universe, well, then the probability is one that we live in, in such a universe. I don't think they want to go in that direction. But this argument is way too strong because it would affect, we need prior probability distributions on these variables to predict anything on the constants, to predict anything from the standard model, because you've got to be able to normalize over them. You've got to be able to marginalize them is the way it, what it's called. If you can't deal with in, infinite ranges of free parameters, a lot of physics is in a lot of trouble. We know how to deal with this. This isn't something weird. We just, we've got the tools for this. We can do it. It's fine. So look, it's, it's true that there are contexts in physics where you normalize a probability distribution over an infinite space. And in fact, when I first came across this issue years ago, um, that was the first thing that I thought of. The normal distribution, for example, is, is normalizable and it's defined over the entire x-axis or the entire real line. Uh, but the thing that's important about this is that they want to use the principle of indifference, which is going to give us a uniform uh, measure. And then there's no defined boundaries on the region over which we're going to place that measure. Uh, if you if you put a uniform distribution over an infinitely large space, then either your distribution, you know, either it's going to have measure zero or it's going to have measure infinity, um, as Graham is right to point out. So it's um, so yeah, yeah, there are there are cases in which you can put probability distributions on infinitely large spaces, but the question here is whether or not the the free parameters that appear in our physical models are cases like that. Niash. So, um, so I think what he is talking about is basically uh, the prior dependence of any Bayesian analysis. So if I uh, basically, I have some prior idea about what the right parameters of a model might be from, from expectations or from prior measurements, I make a new measurements that gives me a likelihood and then if I multiply the two, I get a posterior, which is basically the new best guess on uh, on the parameters. So it is true that any, any statistical analysis, as long as it's Bayesian, it relies on some assumption of a prior because essentially it tells me what range of parameters I should be looking at. And if I change that prior slightly, the answer is gonna slightly change, but that is the part of the measurement that I actually don't trust any, and this is basically what physicists kind of all agree. If your answer depends significantly on your prior, then you don't trust that answer. So, uh, so the part of the answer, which is kind of more or less independent of the prior, that's the one that everybody agrees on. But if there is significant dependence on your prior, then then you don't believe it. Basically, that's that's the way it is. The problem with Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, to yeah. I just want to say the problem with with, with doing the the fine tuning is that the prior is doing all of the work, which is the the basically the most unreliable part of the story is doing all of the heavy lifting for you, uh, which kind of reverses. Uh, yeah. So it's the part that nobody really wants to take seriously is doing all the work for you. I thought that the issue that was being addressed here was maybe I'm wrong about this, but uh, there's a portion of the documentary where, um. You know, there's this normalization problem that was first developed by the McGrews, and I thought that that's what um, that Goff was trying to reply to here. So not a problem about how do we decide our priors, but a problem about how do we normalize uh, a uniform distribution over um, some infinitely large parameter space. Well, I, I think that they're the same problems because, I mean, that's... That's the choice of prior because you assume something is uniform over some range, and that's that is the choice of prior. But you could assume, you could change that range or assume like the inverse of that parameter is uniform over that range. So, so these are all kind of valid choices of prior. 
But ultimately, what I'm saying is the part of your uh, basically physical measurements that you, you trust is the part that's independent of that choice or more or less independent. There is nothing that's completely independent of that choice of prior, but anything that depends on that choice of prior, you don't trust it very much. So that's, I guess that, that was my understanding. Now, I mean, others may disagree with me. Anyone else want to, Barry, you want to say something? And then uh, we should. Uh, I would try to help Goff out. And believe me, I think he needs a lot of help. Um, <laughs> We're uh, going to keep this polite, Barry. Come on. Come this on. argument like this. Look, there are a lot of normalized distributions, a lot of them. So they don't have the problem of normalization, such that if we say we don't know which one of these is right, but we should represent our belief as sort of a set of these distributions, and they would all give pretty much the same result. So for example, in statistical mechanics, it's often pointed out that the uniform distribution is appealed to. There's no problem really about normalization there if you have a, 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 a you know, finite situation. But, but, um, but you get the same results if you have various kinds of distributions continuous with the uniform distribution. They're all pretty much give the same results. Of course, the difference is those distributions have uh, empirical consequences. And so we could check them against that. But the, in this case, they, they, they don't. So I do th think the normalization problem is not such a big deal that they could have things to say about that. The real issue really is, as I keep saying, is that they don't have an account of probability that goes along with their arguments. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Let me give you some context on the next one. So Hans Hal Borson uh, was someone in our film. He's a professor of philosophy of physics at Princeton University. He's also, interestingly, a Christian theist. He, you know, he believes in God, but he does not think the fine tuning is, is a good argument for God. And in fact, he thinks it's argument, it could be used as an argument against God. So we'll hear Hans explain his argument, and then Luke will reply. I think the fine tuning argument can sometimes backfire in a way that hasn't really been noticed by people who put it forward. And that is, if you take as an assumption, which, which I actually think is theologically very well motivated, that not only does God have a say in the game, if God exists, but that God has a say in setting up the rules of the game. So the way you can put that in terms of cosmology is, not only does God get to choose in some sense which of the universes comes about, but he actually has a say about which are more or less likely to come about. Imagine that you believe in some, some infinite being who designed some sort of game for you, and, and you believe also that this being um, so I think in a paper I wrote some time ago, I actually called this being gob. Um, so G-O-B, just for, just for fun. Now imagine that you, before you, you play the game, you think gob really, really likes perp, the color purple, right? So gob really likes the color purple, hates the color yellow, wants you, you're going to play this game where you're going to draw a ball out of a hat and, and you know this is the preference. You know, gob is averse to yellow, loves purple. Okay, so, so now you're going to play the game, but the game is to figure out does, who set up the game. Okay, so you're going to play, you're going to draw the balls out of the hat. Now of course naturally we think, Evidence for Gob's existence is you draw out a purple ball because Gob hates yellow, likes purple. Okay, so imagine now you're going to play the game. You reach down in, you pull out a ball, and it's purple. And you go, okay, I have a fine-tuning argument, right? Gob exists because I got a purple ball. That's evidence that Gob exists. Now, imagine you get round two of the game. Now you get to look inside the hat. Every ball but the one you pull, pulled out was yellow. Every single one. Now what do you do? What's your feeling about Gob's existence? I think the obvious answer is it's a big defeater to the claim that Gob exists. But this is directly analogous to the fine-tuning argument because what we think is we got super lucky. We pulled out the universe analogy of a purple ball, a universe in which life exists. However, we look at the landscape of possible universes and it's an incredibly rare possibility. My reaction, which I think in that case is that's, argue, that's evidence against God's existence. What's generating the low probabilities in the example is just pure numbers. What's generating the low probabilities in uh, the case of fine tuning is not purely the physics, but the assumption of naturalism. You have to throw that in on top and then you get low probabilities. Otherwise you've just got to measure. You have to say, what's the likelihood that this sort of universe would exist? In which case it matters how this universe came about, right? Which is not what's there in the game. Um, so the, the reason why this isn't a worry, it, you know, <laughs> this isn't a problem for God, so to speak, is that um, it's not that there is this low probability that just exists there and that God has somehow created. There's a whole bunch of possibilities. You only get a low probability if you assume God doesn't exist. Um, if God exists, then there's no low probability there. That's that, you know the probability space changes entirely because you're asking the question what God might want to. Luke, I was thinking um, to maybe make your point a little bit more visual for people. So I think what you were saying is that the, the visual that they give of the hat with the yellow, mostly yellow balls and the, the one purple ball, that is what we're assuming is, is happening given naturalism in a Bayesian context, right? That's what the picture looks like on the naturalistic on hypothesis. But if we were to switch and move to the theistic hypothesis, then the hat would be full of purple balls in that case, right? Because we're switching hypotheses. What sort of, what, what would we expect? If theism were true, we'd expect to find a hat full of purple balls. Is that kind of, does that help explain what yeah, your I guess, 
I, I guess so. That that the changing there's not the probability, right? And then and then you're trying to think about you know the, the hypotheses. That in this case the hypotheses are generating the probabilities. And so on theism, what you would expect is you would expect to find life. You would expect that most of the universes that God would create would be purple in a sense. Okay, uh, here's. Yeah. Sorry, just before we, we get a reply to that, I just want you to remember that last sentence. On theism, we would expect to find life, because that's going to come up later in the next one. Um, but um, does it, I've got actually a reply from Hans Havorsen. Maybe, maybe I should read that. He was very apologetic that he couldn't make this. Um, so I'll go ahead and read his reply, though. So, uh, so open quote. Um, First of all, Barnes' claim is just false as a description of scientific practice. The scientists who derived these probabilities were not assuming atheism. If they were, then their papers should have been rejected because you are supposed to declare all of your hypotheses and to include them in your derivations. None of the papers in the physical journal says, we are assuming that God does not exist. These papers are supposed to be neutral on the question of God's existence, i.e. they should treat the probability of God and the probability of not God as complete unknowns, and so irrelevant to their derivations. To give an analogy, I have no idea whether Prince Harry owns a Porsche 911, so my derivation of probabilities are not based on the assumption that he does, nor on the assumption that he does not. If I'm right about the above point, then Barnes is committed to a strange picture where a person would lower her credence in God when she learns physics. Imagine that a fictional scenario where a teenager, Alice, has high probability for God, but doesn't know much physics. In particular, she doesn't know that physicists believe that the probability for life is low. So Alice might assume that the probability um, for life given God is fairly high, and consequently the probability for life permitting universe is fairly high. But then Alice goes to university to read physics, and she learns that the probability for life is quite low. In that case, Alice is rationally compelled either to lower the probability of God or to lower the probability of life given God. And I repeat, it is not atheist physicists that leads to the conclusion that life is unlikely. It's just standard textbook physics. Does Barnes think that the textbook physics is premised on atheism? If that's the case, then it violates the US law against state support of religion. And lastly, if the probabilities are conditioned on conditional on naturalism, then Barnes and other theists should have other probabilities. Where do they derive them from? Is there a theistic physics that yields different probabilities than standard physics? So close quote. So that was Hans' response. So, and if anyone else wants to um, chip in on that. So, it, nope. so one okay. of the things that's going on here, because um, I was looking back at uh, Luke's book again today, um, is that, so the way that he compares the theistic hypothesis against naturalism is that he thinks that naturalism is completely uninformative um, and then he thinks that if theism were true, we should expect there to exist uh, moral agents of a particular sort, um, or at least that the likelihood of that is larger on theism than it is on uh, a completely uninformative hypothesis like naturalism. Uh, what's a little bit strange about that idea, um, even if we set aside Hans Halverson's argument, is that it seems to me that naturalism is not completely uninformative, even if you take naturalism to be the sort of hypothesis that Luke takes it to be. I mean, here's a statement that naturalism should predict. Uh, if um, if there are any uh, sentient agents, then they are physically embodied. And theism makes no such prediction. So if we use the principle of indifference in the way that Luke suggests that we do, that it like that any time that we have a hypothesis that is in some sense uninformative that we apply uniform distribution of all of the possibilities that are consistent with that hypothesis then what we should do is uh, when we evaluate theism is to apply uniform distribution over all of the different ways uh that there could be moral agents right that's as if we like concede almost everything to luke but now it's going to turn out that theism doesn't in fact predict a finely tuned universe Right. I mean, it's it's only naturalism that does that. So I, it, it seems to me that this entire that Luke's entire argument is sort of backwards. Right. And I always think that the statement that naturalism, you know, you only get low probability on naturalism. But he also said it matters how this universe came about. But we don't currently have a naturalistic account of how the universe came about, or at least not an agreed upon one. We have various well, competing models. Yeah, so like, and certainly not one that that it like is entailed by naturalism. I mean, so Luke is clear in his book that we that he thinks we ought to distinguish between naturalism, which he takes to be a completely uninformative hypothesis, and uh, substantive scientific hypotheses, 
which she is clear are not part of naturalism. So if we had an account of how the universe came about, a scientific account of how the universe came about, predictably Luke would tell us that that's, a, that's, not, that's not part of naturalism, that's part of science. I, I find that distinction honestly quite strange, but that is what he says. Okay, so the, unless anyone's got anything else to say, um, we'll go to the next criticism. And the context of this is that, um, Barry, you you uh, made an argument about, um, I think it was something like, you know, if we had an idea of what we should expect, given God, we should expect no Holocaust. But we did get a Holocaust. So this argument has been refuted. I think you said something like not once, not twice, but you know, a trillion times over. Um, and then in, in the narration for that, we say, well, you know, Luke, has said that he thinks life is likely given theism. Advocates of the argument like Luke Barnes claim that life would be likely given theism. And that is exactly not what I say. So if you all open your, uh, your, your books to page 341, all I say is at the top of the page, a universe capable of producing and sustaining life forms, such creatures, is a universe with moral worth, one that God might create. This might, it seems, is enough. Moving on, only an extraordinary strong assumption against the idea that God would want to create a universe with embodied moral agents will affect our conclusions. But no fine-tuning defender defends the idea that we, we that life would be likely given theism. You don't need that for the argument because it's a comparison. But stronger than I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was even worse. If you've watched the whole thing, it's even worse. Um, so I think what's interesting here, I think I should take this one. Um, that the form of the, the counter is interesting uh, because the fact that he said something there doesn't mean he couldn't have said something else elsewhere. So I think the right reply should be to challenge me to give an example of where he might have said that. And I think I'm, I'm happy to meet that challenge because only before when he talked about the, the gob example, he said... You only get a low probability if you assume God doesn't exist. Um, if God exists, then there's no low probability there. That... You know, and he also said, you know, the analogy for the God case would be the hat is filled up with purple balls. Right. So if the hat is filled up with purple balls, you know, if that's the analogy here, um, then life should be likely given theism. That just seems to to follow for me. So it literally just said it a few minutes earlier. And so on theism, what you would expect is you would expect to find life. You would expect that most of the universes that God would create would be purple in a sense. OK, uh, here's uh, now you might say, OK, um, but you didn't see that when you made the film. Um, but I took that from the conference that you hosted, Barry, uh, at, at Rutgers. And he said, this universe, is it what I would expect on naturalism? Is it what I would expect on theism? The best handle I can get on that is this kind of, as a, maybe this is the scientific brain kicking in where it shouldn't. But it, I, I would like to say something like, okay, if, if the, the fine tuning argument in words would basically be on naturalism, there's no reason to expect one universe as any other. So sort of any universe is, is kind of unexpected on that level. Maybe I don't want to say that. But if, if I'm a theist, I would expect a universe with positive moral value, like this one, which has beings in it which can learn and love and all of that sort of thing. So, so Barnes says he's not claiming that if theism is true, then life is likely. That's right. But that doesn't, the argument depends on that. What it, what it, it depends on, and I, I think it's completely wrong, but what it depends on is that life is more likely given theism than given whatever the opposite is, naturalism. That's what does the work. In a Bayes theorem uh, issue, problem, it's the likelihoods as, I forget who said that before, maybe Graham or maybe maybe I said that. That's what does all the work in the in, in it. So he could, you know, sort of get away with saying, oh, he didn't say it was likely, but, and that's right, he didn't. And, it, and so you need, or if he did, he could take it back, but, but he could say it's more likely. But then the real issue is where do these, likelihoods come from even worse than barry was uh barry was saying because the luke actually makes the claim that no no fine-tuning defender says that life is probable given theism but there are many who do i mean for instance um in william lane craig's version of the fine-tuning argument which is a very bad version of the argument but nonetheless it's one that is given in the literature the claim is made that life is probable given theism um, it's very arrogant to say nobody makes it. I mean, lots of right. people make <laughs> You can find street preachers making the argument. How the hell does he know what they say? Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, so I think that he did say, you know, that the universe in the Rutgers conference, uh, that this is this universe is what he would expect given theism. And, and I think it's at least reasonable to say, well, if you think this is what you should expect, 
then what you should expect should be probable. I mean, how can you expect yeah. something that is improbable, right? So that just it doesn't make sense. And the other thing I would say is it's a sort of dodge, right? Because the real problem is whether you say it's life is likely given theism or just more likely given theism, still the problem is the same. How do you know what is likely or more likely given theism? You know, I think you you brought up the Gnostics in the, in the film, Dan, and the, the Gnostic cosmology, the Gnostics, they were Christians. You know, they believe in God, they believe in Jesus. Um, and what they believed was that the creator God, the, sorry, the original God didn't want to create a physical universe. They only wanted spiritual beings. And the creation of the physical universe was, was an act of an evil demiurge. So it's not a, obvious at all, even if you believe in Jesus, you know, that God should create the physical universe because the Gnostics didn't think that that's what a good God would do. And so I just think, you know, how do you justify that? I don't see how. It's under naturalism that you need the constants to have the right values in order for life to exist. Under theism, life could exist under any conditions whatsoever. Almost all of the fine-tuning arguments that are actually sort of defended in the literature are probability arguments. Right? You, you don't come to the conclusion, therefore God exists, they're not any sort of proof or demonstration. They're probability arguments. You cannot do anything to a probability argument by raising mere possibilities, logically. Not, you, you cannot affect a probability argument in any way by raising mere possibilities. The whole point of the argument is that there's various open possibilities, Right? If you didn't have those, you'd have a deductive argument. You'd have something that was a proof. You'd have a very solid argument. So just saying it's possible for this to happen, or this to be the case, or that to be the case, isn't something that can possibly affect the fine-tuning argument. So what it's possible for God to do, fine. I mean, no, there's no point, and I'll, I'll bang on about this a bit more later. There's no point at which the fine-tuning argument pretends that God must do this or must do that. So things that are possible for God to do, um, it, uh, you know, the, the fine-tuning argument doesn't have a firm opinion on that. So it leaves open these possibilities. If you want this to affect the fine-tuning argument, you'd better start arguing about what is likely, not just what is possible. The whole reason that we're told the nationalism is improbable is because naturalism is supposedly uninformative and the uninformativeness of naturalism means on his view that we put a uniform distribution over the space of like all the different ways that naturalism could be true um shouldn't we be doing the same thing with god that there's many things that god could do that are consistent with god's character right Should, shouldn't we place a uniform distribution over all of those if, if his view about the principle indifference is correct say so, i mean my intuition is if god is perfect and existed without the universe and he should just stay that way. <laughs> you know? Of course, Luke will have a different intuition, but of course, how do we establish who's is right and who's is wrong? Well, what you better not do is like, you know, I, you, you can always draw a target around the bullet holes in the side of a barn, right? And then declare victory. That's way too easy. And if that's what the theist wants to do, if they want to say that they look around the world and then they conjure up a hypothesis that predicts exactly what they see, it seems to me that that's not a good way to generate a hypothesis. And it seems to me that that's the way that most theists actually do generate their theistic hypotheses. Yeah, yeah, she wants to come in. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, I wanted to use a phrase, which I, I think no, some, I thought somebody should say that God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> so my thinking is that, you know, if you're, a, imagine you think someone's rigged the lottery. Um, and you're trying to look for suspects, you know, a being that could conjure money up into thin air doesn't seem like your prime suspect because they don't need to win the lottery. And I think that was the point that, that Sean was making. Imagine that theism was some other kind of hypothesis and we want to see whether we, we can treat it like any other hypothesis. Imagine I hypothesize that I have a model that goes through every data point that exists, right? So, uh, and I said, that is my model. I, I have a model that, this is my model. It goes through every every observation that uh, is made. This is my model. The, nobody, no scientist would take it seriously because, okay, I mean, it's, it's it's kind of a cheap thing to say that, okay, I can fit everything. You can cook up something to fit everything. The, the real, uh, I mean, art is to actually predict something that hasn't been measured and... Uh, and that that's 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 the real kind of challenge. Real low, uh, if if you have a predictive model, that's what you want. But if ju just saying that I have a model that predicts there is life, and we do see there is life, that that's not. I mean, if if it was any other scientific hypothesis, nobody would take it seriously. So the last one, but one is about Boltzmann brain. So just a bit of context. This is the idea that if you wait long enough, you know, a random fluctuation of a brain can happen, and um, if there were a multiverse, that the Boltzmann brains should dominate the multiverse. And since we're not Boltzmann brains, that's argument against the multiverse. And of course, we know that multiverse is sometimes employed to respond to the fine-tuning argument. So we put this to Sean Carroll, and we'll hear a little bit from him, and then a reply from Luke. 
you should avoid those particular versions of the multiverse, which are dominated by Boltzmann brains. That's not that hard to do. You can't say, I've got this range of um, hypotheses that I think are live, and I'm going to try to explain the data in terms of one of them. Um, and yet a whole a bunch of them have a problem. Oh, all that's telling me is not to, um, to use those to, to focus on the other one in the set. The, the problem there is that's not how Bayesian testing works. If you had a bunch of live options open, which get some decent fraction of the prior probability, and then they get ruled out by data, if they come under a sort of broad heading of things you're interested in, what that means is a bunch of your, um, you know, your probabilities take a hit because of that. They have to take a hit. The probability of the multiverse does go down in general if it turns out that a lot of um, multiverses have this specific problem. Uh, Carol says there are versions of the multiverse which are not, don't have these problems. Yet that's correct. The question is whether you have to <clears throat> fine tune them in order to avoid this problem or whether they are in fact generically avoid this problem. And that's a very much an open question. I don't know if we have any multiverse supporters here, but Barry, it sounds like you want to say something. Yeah, I mean, what Luke is saying here is that, look, there's this uh, multiverse hypothesis, but a lot of versions of it have Boltzmann brains in it, and we know we're not a Boltzmann brain, so that's evidence against multiverse hypothesis. Let's use the same thinking for Luke's theism. There are lots of versions of theism, including that God just loves Boltzmann brains. <laughs> <laughs> no, and many, many others you could cook up. You know, all God really cares about is having a universe with a lot of stars or with some meteors or who knows what. So put them in the thing too. It was completely unconstrained because the whole theism is, is completely unconstrained. So, you know, I think if somebody comes up with a scientific multiverse hypothesis, which maybe has some evidence because there are facts that we can observe, which support that version of it. And it turns out that it you know, has a consequence that in order to get the support for the values in our universe, I should say, I don't believe it, okay. I'm much more on the Steinhardt side of the sort of discussion, but um, uh, then um, you know that that's a particular version, a particular scientific hypothesis, and that's the one that's at issue that's going to stand in for naturalism, not you know all the possible multiverse hypotheses. I think it might be valuable for the viewers just to point out that multiverse hypotheses are not <laughs> so it's often repeated on the internet. And in other places, that the reason why people conjured up multiverse hypotheses was so that atheists could rest easy with fine-tuning and they wouldn't have to worry about it. And this is all nonsense. The reason that physicists generated multiverse hypotheses was because they had cosmological hypotheses that they thought had independent motivation and they end up making probable, like if you accept that the, that the hypothesis itself is probable, then it's also probable that there are other regions that look like the the region that we inhabit look like the uh, observable universe and physicists call those other universes. Um, and furthermore, these hypotheses have fine tuning issues as well. Yeah, right, fine tuning in the in the physicist sense that I brought up earlier that, right, um, right. yeah. Uh, and then there's a, there's a debate about, um, you know, how probable or improbable or how plausible or implausible any one of those models is. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it's, so if, if you have some datum that counts against uh, some members of a family of theories, I don't think it's generally true that the, um, that, that, that that family gets its probability cut, uh, both because you might have independent reason why the family could also move up in probability and also that individual members of the family might increase in probability. Uh, so, so maybe I can argue against this a little bit. Uh, so, uh, I kind of agree with 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 Luke on this that uh, I mean, multiverse does get a hit if some versions of it doesn't work. But I mean, the same applies for theism. That if I believe in a kind God that doesn't let violence happen in the world, and then I have to see violence happen in front of me, then my my faith would fade. And this is how many people lose their faith, if their faith, because their version of the God, their idealized version of the God that they have somehow doesn't hold up to what happens in the real universe. And um, so I think theism also gets a hit that way. Uh, so the it, kind God hypothesis gets a hit, but not the like malicious God hypothesis. 
Well, well, right. So there will be different, uh, different faithful people. Some, some, some people may may lose faith. Other wouldn't. So, but as as a yeah. whole, there will be fewer. Uh, uh, there would be. Uh, I mean, I come from Iran, uh, and I have uh, I have a personal experience with with the with the government that uh, I mean it was a theocracy, and I know that I mean the the religion uh, takes a hit when you see bad things that happen under the name of the religion. Uh, not everybody would lose faith that way, but uh, as a, as a probabilistic a statement, it does happen that if if different versions of faith just don't hold up to their promise, then that uh, then faith as a whole takes a hit. And I so think the, mm -hmm. sorry. In the case of the multiverse, what I'm suggesting is that you know, so you realize that you're not a Boltzmann brain. Some of these hypotheses uh, have Boltzmann brains that predominate, but and, and so those certainly take a hit. But if you have another hypothesis uh, that on which Boltzmann brains do not predominate, mm -hmm. but that also includes a multiverse, yeah. it's not clear to me how that hypothesis would take a hit. And you might even think that that hypothesis is raised in probability. Uh, if so, you, I mean, you know, what happens to the the, prob yeah, the probability of the family of hypotheses um, that includes both of those cases is unclear to me, right? Because it's going to depend well, upon details about how the probabilities of the individual members of the family change okay so i don't think we have like a strong multiverse proponent here on the panel so i'm going to bring <laughs> one in um i've got a clip this is me and alan Guth discussing the issue because i put this to him and i sort of raise the question well doesn't a single universe also have a boltzmann brain problem uh and there's this that means that can't be the way we decide whether or not there's a multiverse okay so it seems to me that problem is true even if there's no multiverse if you just have one single universe expanding forever then you have the same problem. It's not specific to the multiverse, am I right? Uh, that's right. Uh, one way out of it uh, is certainly to accept the notion of a multiverse, that our universe is not the only one, but one of many pocket universes. And then the Boltzmann brains in our universe can be outnumbered by normal life in parallel universes. Uh, and for many kinds of measures, uh, the Boltzmann brain problem can be solved. And reading about inflation, the, the take-home message seems to be you can get a whole universe with a teeny tiny nugget of inflationary energy. That's right. So maybe that could spontaneously fluctuate more, more likely to fluctuate than a whole brain, which is like incredibly complicated. <laughs> is, uh, that, is that right? Am I thinking on the right lines? Uh, it, well, uh, y y you are, um, uh, but nobody knows. Uh, th these, compli th these estimates are complicated. That's my, my take on it, is that no one knows. Or in fact, this is something that Luke Barnes actually said. He said, um, you know, whether you have to fine tune them, uh, multiverse models, in order to avoid this problem, or whether they are generically able to avoid the problem. And that's very much an open question. And I think we all agree that that's an open question. And therefore, it can't really be a sort of defeater for those that propose the multiverse as a solution to the fine tuning problem. Because you don't, I don't think you have to show the multiverse exists. You only have to show it's at least as possible as God. That's, that's the only bar you really, I think, have to meet. You don't have to say, you know, I believe in the multiverse. Um, so, yeah, I think we, we're, Hopefully, we're in agreement that we don't know what the measure is. Um, all right. So the last one from Luke and Philip Goff is about the entropy issue. So to give a bit of context, Roger Penrose and Alan, Go uh, sorry, and Sean Carroll both sort of highlight this point that the entropy of the early universe was very, very low and um, much lower than you would need for life. So neither God nor the multiverse is going to explain it. Example of a fine tuning that was not just for us to exist, right? It was clearly some dynamical mechanism that has nothing to do with the existence of life, yet we have some fine tuning to be explained. It could very well be that other fine tunings have similar dynamical explanations. The, the problem there is that, again, it's just smuggling in an assumption that fine tuning arguments don't make. There's no assumption in fine tuning arguments that the only reason this universe exists is for life forms like us that's not any part of it that only has to be one of the reasons there could be other reasons that a designer or someone something goal directed might have for the universe so i have two comments uh first of all it may not be an assumption made that god doesn't have other reasons but again luke's entire the, the reason he thinks naturalism has a low probability to begin with is because he thinks it's an, it's an uninformative hypothesis and then he's going to put a uniform distribution over all of the universes that are consistent with naturalism. Well, fine. 
God might have all sorts of inscrutable reasons that we don't know, but by you know Luke's own logic, we should put a uniform distribution over all of the reasons that God might have, all, all of God's inscrutable reasons, um, which ends up meaning that we should put a uniform distribution over all of the different ways the universe could be that are consistent with the existence of like morally significant sentient creatures, right? Because he thinks that that's what our universe, what, what apparently God, one of the things that God had in mind when, when fine tuning our universe. Um, well, if that's what he wants there to be, then, you know, Penrose has already calculated how large uh, or how small of a probability that is. It's one out of 10 to the 10 to the 123 or something like this, right? It's, just, it's absurdly small probability if you put a uniform measure over the space of all the ways, different ways the universe could be that are consistent with uh, our existence, um, right? But then theism would have to take precisely that hit. The other thing I wanted to say is that this is going to be a question about which Again, it's going to depend upon how you choose your probability. You know, Barry and um, David Albert and others have been developing this thing that they call the mentaculus for quite some time. Um, one of the statements- well, Thanks for taking it seriously. I noticed that. I, I guess you took it seriously. <laughs> so- Barry, can you explain what is the mentaculus? Well, it's something that would be very familiar. It's just taking seriously statistical mechanics the, and statistical mechanics in, adds to the dynamical laws and whatever the fundamental ontology is that governs the dynamical laws, it adds a probability distribution over the possible microstates of the universe and the claim that the entropy of the universe was very, very, very low at a, about 13.8 billion years from now. It's not doesn't add that the 13.8 year, billion years ago is in the past, just that it's 13 billion, 13.8 billion years from now, and then it's argued that it, that is the past because we can now derive the difference between the past and the future from these two assumptions. These two assumptions, I think, were amazingly powerful and fruitful for philosophers. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure how many people have been convinced that it's on the right track. And there is an issue about what probability could mean in this account, and that's what I alluded to earlier, and I do think there's a good account of how you can be can explain how it is that the facts of our universe can make these this is the right probability distribution. Well, the only other thing I want to say about the metaculus, because you don't want, I mean, Phil, I'm happy for you to do a film about the metaculus. <laughs> yeah, maybe if I'm back in New York, we can make work on that. My, that's shirt, really that's my, see my, my shirt here is because I taught a yeah. summer school and all the for graduate students in philosophy and physics, and they all got metaculus t-shirts. So this is Mine and anybody want one, just send me a note and I can get you a Mentaculus t shirt. I'll do that. Um, but the reason I, I brought up the Mentaculus is that part of the Mentaculus vision is this idea that all of this, that the probability of any given statement that we make in the sciences needs to be conditionalized on the three statements that appear in the Mentaculus. And if that's correct, then the probability that the universe began in a low entropy state is not. Uh, you know, one out of 10 to the 10 to the 123, it's one. Exactly. And so the, uh, you know, I, so it depends really sensitively on how we pick out our probabilities. If we do it the way that Barry suggests, then the, you know, the, the entropy of the universe is not fine-tuned at all. So there's... But of course, somebody looks at that. I can, I can be sympathetic with John Carroll, who looks at that and he says, wouldn't it be nice if I can come up with a explanation of why the universe has such low entropy at that point. And Sean Carroll's come up with a, I, I'm not sure where, what he, you know, I, I could just saw him a few days ago, but I should have asked, but I don't know if he still believes this thing or not that he, he talks about in From Eternity Here and elsewhere. But, you know, he has a cosmological hypothesis, which does explain why universes, when they come into existence in general, have very low entropy. That's interesting. And if there's other reasons to believe that, that would make an interesting competitor to the idea that it's just a brute fact. So we'll just finish off um, by playing a clip, not from Luke Barnes and Philip Barth, um, but there's a reply to the fine tuning argument, which is proposed by Lee Smolin called cosmological natural selection. And the idea here is that we've seen this problem before. You know, if you arrange the genes randomly, you won't get sort of uh, any decent functional organism. But that just tells you it wasn't random, but that doesn't mean it wasn't natural, right? So Darwinian selection gives you uh, 
some mechanism where you, you get these um, fit organisms, um, fitter than you would expect through random chance. And so what Smolin tries to do is to sort of apply that to the universe and say, well, maybe uh, black holes give rise birth to new universes and they inherit um, the constants, but slightly different. So then you've got this equivalence of Darwinian natural selection. What's being selected for is the black holes because, you know, they will make new universes. And oh, happily enough, stars generate black holes. So life is, comes about by a sort of happy byproduct. And um, they didn't reply to this argument. I think it's a very ingenious argument. Um, and uh, however, someone else has replied to it, uh, um, called, a guy called uh, Trent Horn, I think his name is, a, a Catholic apologist. And he made some claims about it. And I thought, well, just finish off by hearing those claims. First, current estimates suggest that the universe will expand forever based on the strength of gravity and the amount of matter in the universe. So this would rule out an eternally expanding and contracting model to generate a multiverse. Second, a universe with many black holes would be dangerous for life because the black holes would create violent disruptions in planetary orbits. Third, and most important, there is evidence against the idea that black holes even tunnel into other universes. Even Stephen Hawking, who once believed this could be the case, he reversed his position when fellow physicist John Preskill showed him compelling evidence that information escapes black holes and it stays in our universe. This radiation, which is now called Hawking radiation, seeps out during the death of a black hole. And so the information or matter within a black hole does not tunnel into a baby universe. It escapes back into our own universe. Hawking's even at an event at a conference, he informed the audience of this tragic news. He said, there is no baby universe branching off, as I once thought. The information remains firmly in our universe. I'm sorry to disappoint science fiction fans, but if information is preserved, there is no possibility of using black holes to travel to other universes. So I guess Niyash is probably one for you. Um... There's three, three claims here. So the first is that dark energy implies the universe won't recollapse, and therefore that rules out cosmological natural selection. So any, any comment on that claim? Uh, I thought cosmological natural selection has to do with formation of the black holes, not, not the recollapse. Right. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I don't think there's any recollapse predicted in the model, so it's irrelevant. Yeah, that, that, that one is not relevant because I don't think you need to recall up. All you need is to form black holes for cosmological natural selection. Right, Actually, okay. so I guess the there are two main assumptions. Sorry, I should say. The one is that you form black holes and the other that the parameters of the of the baby universe are a small uh, kind of a, a small uh, difference from the parameters of the parent universe. Right, okay. Uh, so the next objection was universes optimized for black holes would be dangerous for life as it would create violent disruptions for planetary orbits. Is that, is that correct? Uh, well, I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, black holes, uh, I, I guess there's a fam famous saying the astronomers say that the black holes don't suck, <laughs> uh, which I don't think is entirely correct, but nonetheless, basically but what black holes do, that their gravity of a black hole is like gravity of anything else. So... Um, if the sun becomes a black hole, suddenly, uh, uh, as far as gravity is concerned, it's the same uh, for us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I can certainly imagine if there is a, uh, there, there is a universe that has too many black holes in it, uh, then it could be hard to, to life as we know it to exist. If, if it's kind of black hole comes, comes through my room every second, then it would be hard for me to exist the way I am right now. Uh, but I mean, you could, I, I mean, there, there could be a lot of other things that happen in, in that kind of universe. So it's hard Smolens to find. Model, uh, Smolens models, uh, from what I understand, has a mechanism for preventing this, right? So if you have too many, if, if, if you have too many black holes in a given universe, then you have too much mass energy in that universe and it will tend to collapse very quickly. So mm -hmm. the universes that end up predominantly and predominating in Smolens model end up being larger universes that are not going to collapse back on themselves mm -hmm. um, because those are the ones that you actually able to form the largest numbers of, of black holes because they sit around the longest period of time. Right. Good. Good. In any yeah. case, you just need you just need a few universes, so to speak, for a, a, a relatively short period of time, a few billions of years, in which the black holes don't disrupt things. I mean, nobody's mentioned anthropic reasoning, but there's something right about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I don't see that this, you know, like I said before, it strikes me that getting into the weeds of these arguments back and forth is 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 like engaging them when the when the background here is just completely misguided. Yeah, yeah. I said something like that at the beginning of my in the introduction to my dissertation. Um, 
often in the case of the Kalam argument, often what you see is that people are talking about they'll debate about the, the plausibility or implausibility of specific cosmological models. But this seems completely misguided to me. If if the there are so many speculative cosmological models that are just proposed as toy models to see if you can like construct a model of a particular sort. The if if there are if there are at least two cosmological models that are more probable than any others, then you can you can prove trivially that you can't have a model that is more than fifty percent probable. Um, so if the two most probable models are uh, are equally probable, um, then it follows that you can't have that neither is going to be more than fifty percent probable. Um, which you know, I mean, what, what this generally suggests is that like the probability of most, uh, if you if you take all this stuff about objective Bayesianism and so on seriously, most of the cosmological models that we that we have are going to be improbable. So so I wouldn't be surprised to learn that Smolin's model is improbable. But so what? Like I don't know why that should bother us, right? I mean, right. It, it's just an idea to see, you know, could could it be? The Darwinian is. right yeah it's it's what in, in philosophy of biology some people uh say things like oh this isn't a um crap I forget I forget the terminology they use but so uh oh it's a how possibly explanation and so sometimes in evolutionary biology uh the claim is made oh this feature couldn't have possibly evolved the proper response is just to deliver a model where it does but it's not to say that that's how it did evolve but it's just to show that there are mechanisms that could do this. And likewise with Smolin's model, I take it that it's something like that. It's just, just to show that this is one way that things could have gone, not that this in particular is the way that they definitely went. And so the last point was about the information paradox, I think. So just to clear what that is, general relativity tells us that information is destroyed in black holes. Quantum mechanics says no. And we don't know which one to trust. And we always get these headlines that this has been uh, resolved. Uh, and, and that, I think, is what uh, Trent was appealing to there, Hawkins' claim that it has been resolved. But Niayash, uh, has it been resolved? <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's an active debate. Uh, now, I can, uh, I can tell that there's a, there's, kind of, there's a trend in theoretical physics uh, where uh, Within that trend and within within, within uh, this picture, which uh, was I guess originally came from a string theory, at least the, the most uh, the dominant uh, pr proponents of them are st uh, string theories. This is known a holographic picture. The idea is uh, information products might have been resolved, although none of the people who actually have worked on it, if you talk to them, they they claim they have a resolution. They they think they have an idea for how the resolution may come about, and now. Whether baby universes are ruled out within within that, it's not clear. Uh, the idea is that information is not lost. The information is kind of stays there, hangs around for a very, very long time and uh, eventually gets out. But uh, uh, but it may take a very, very long time by our standards, uh, um, orders of magnitude or longer than the age of universe. Uh, and within that time, whether the baby universe may exist, uh, that's that's plausible. Um, so um, so yeah, the information paradox is not solved. There is there is a framework for it that uh, a lot of physicists are a big fan of. Uh, but even within that framework, uh, there is not nothing against having a baby universe. It's just that it they wouldn't last forever. Um, yeah. Is it also right to say that that just has nothing to do with Smolin's model? <laughs> Like, uh, well, I mean, I'm I'm at Parameter Institute, which is I mean, this is the logo here, and that Lee is one of one of my colleagues. Um, so uh, historically, there have been two two camps for quantum gravity. There was uh, loop quantum gravity, and which was co-founded by Leo Smolin, uh, and there was a string theory, uh, and uh, holography is kind of a big trend in the string theory, although it's not limited entirely. Uh, so uh, I think when Lee suggested uh, cosmological natural selection, that was before th there was holography. Um, now, whether it's contradicted by holography, I, I don't well, think so. 
so at least in the clip that was played, you know, what he's talking about is uh, the, the person who was speaking in the clip, what he was talking about was like, you know, tunneling into a baby universe. But I didn't think that Smolin's model involved like tunneling from a black hole into a, a child universe. Um, well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's kind of the, the words are being used loosely, but what happens when the black hole collapses, the center of a black hole this thing is uh, behind me, there is yeah. a singularity. And what is uh, what singularity is kind of an instance, kind of like a big bang, but reversed. Uh, what when we get to it, what happens is anyone's a speculation. And um, one possibility, which I mean, originally, in fact, Hawking proposed it himself, is uh, you you can get uh, a baby universe. Now, why it's called tunneling? Uh, usually, physicists call uh, things that cannot happen within classical physics tunneling. Like you can, I can like run and then pass through the wall. And in quantum mechanics, it could happen with some probability. Classically, it cannot happen. And uh, basically, classical physics uh, is uh, tells you that physics ends at the singularity. So it's kind of like a wall. Um, and going beyond that, um, it's kind of loosely called tunneling, even though we don't actually have a, a, a mechanism for it to happen. Uh, so I think it's a loose kind of use of uh, terminology. Yeah. OK, I, like, I think the question about what you just said. Say again, Barry. Is it right that classical physics rules out walking through walls? Uh, well, uh, I but think there's so. be a small statistical mechanical probability that the state <laughs> of the wall and, the, and you are such that it gets you through the wall. Well, it's a um, it's a good. You mean classically, you can you can walk through the wall with some. I mean, I can crash into the wall. I guess that's true. I, yeah. There's that it, literally it, you go through. Yeah, I, I couldn't literally go. I don't think it's ruled out. Okay, there are yeah. states which allow for that. Yeah, I mean, there is some small probability that like the wall dissolves into a gas and then yeah. reforms. I mean, after small is not out. the right word to use, here, but yeah, but I, I just look. I hope, I hope uh, we're not going to hit the wall of our, our audience's patience, but we've we've managed to get this conversation in less than two hours, which I'm amazed at. Um, so. I want to thank everyone. Uh, you've been amazing. It's been really, really fascinating, and um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what comes out of this. So thanks a lot, guys.